Okay, we are starting. Uh, I'll just introduce uh, the course. So our course is called as Hits and Misses in Oculoplasty. And we'll be covering a whole uh, spectrum of uh, oculoplasty, touching a little bit of oncology and orbit and lacrimal. The purpose of this uh, IC is basically to uh, talk about uh, what we have learned from our own mistakes so that going forth uh, certain simple cases and challenging cases, you know what to look for. So with that, I'd uh, like to introduce a uh, dear uh, friend and colleague, uh, Dr. Akshay Nair. Uh, Akshay is basically trained uh, from Shankar Netral and done his fellowship from LV Prasad Eye Institute. He's also done an ICO fellowship at New York uh, Eye and Ear Infirmary. But above all this and his numerous publications, which actually cross over a hundred publications in peer reviewed journals and multiple awards. Uh, his, he's an exceptional presenter, uh, surgeon, and uh, each presentation is done with a lot of effort, care, research, and especially research, which is something his forte, and I think he's uh, set a, a very good example for the past and the forthcoming uh, generations to uh, you know, sort of put their hands into research in spite of doing private practice. So over to you, Akshay. Akshay will be talking about hits and misses of conjunctival pigmented lesions. Thank you, Savri. The, you could have shortened the introduction, so those two minutes which I could have exceeded, you've taken up. So anyways, thank you for, for, for that. I'll, I'll be talking about pigmented lesions on the conjunctiva, and given that the premise of our course is case-based, so we will be discussing these lesions uh, on a case-by-case -case lesion. So oftentimes we get patients who are referred to us with pigmented lesions on the conjunctiva with a diagnosis or a suspected diagnosis being whether it's a conjunctival nevus, uh, melanocytosis, conjunctival melanoma or simply put they just ref get referred with a with, you know with a sheet that says conjunctival hyperpigmentation uh, or what is called primary acquired melanosis. So we need to be able to differentiate what is what and once we are able to identify what the condition is plan the, uh, the management of the patient based on what we think it is. Now this is the simplest and the most commonest thing that we see. A patient, a, a teenager who has had a small brown speck in the eye since childhood and now it was uh, increasing in size recently. The mother is worried saying that we've seen that in the past six months it suddenly increased and obviously Dr. Google has told her that it could be a cancer of the eye. So then they're worried and they came. So the things that we look for in the examination is that it is unilateral. It is present since birth, elevated, and you can see it's got a variegated appearance. There are areas within it which are not as dark as the others. And there are intralesional cystic spaces and feeder vessels are there. Now feeder vessels doesn't always mean that it is a cancer or it's a tumor. Conjunctival nemus typically are seen on the bulbar conjunctiva and as you can see, an OCT of that will show up these intracystic lesions. So this, this for example, is well not an amelanotic but a hypopigmented nevus. And again, you can appreciate the cystic areas within. The treatment of choice is to observe, document it either photographically or at least in your notes with the measurements and six monthly follow up. However, if there are patients who say for cosmetic reasons they want to excise it, you may absolutely go ahead and excise it and patch it up with either an autograft or an amniotic membrane. Progression to melanoma, very rarely, extremely rarely, less than 2% of melanomas are conjunctival nevi that transform into melanoma. And we'll see that a little ahead. This is the second type of case that we see. This is a 44-year-old lady. She's always had these lesions, these what she calls as dark spots. And recently, she has noticed an increase in pigmentation. There is no pain. Now, what are the clinical features that we look for? It's recent onset of hyperpigmentation and again, variable pigmentation, areas that are extremely dark and areas that are not dark. Compared to a nevus which was elevated, this is absolutely flat and you can actually with a, a bud move and see that only the pigmented pigmentation is on the conjunctiva. There are no feeders. This is non -circum not circumscribed. As you can see, it's diffuse and all over the place. This is what is called primary acquired melanosis or PAM. And PAM is the only thing that we need to be a little worried about. The reason for that being that abnormal melanocytes, what happens in PAM is abnormal melanocytes from the epithelium are responsible for this. 
and what decides the further plan of action is whether there is cellular ATP or not. And cellular ATP or not is something that only a pathologist can tell us. Remember, PAM with ATP carries a 50% risk of evolution into malignant conjunctival melanoma. PAM without ATP carries a 0% risk of melanoma development. And ATP is something, like I said, a pathologist will tell you. So if you see a patient with PAM, observation is not an option. A biopsy is the plan of action, which means if there is a small area of PAM less than three clock hours, if you are certain that it is you are it, it is PAM, you should excise it completely, such that you can rule out ATP. If more than clock three clock hours, a MAP biopsy should be done, and double freeze cryotherapy to all sides. There is a recent paper that's come out last year that says that PAM has been treated in two patients with interferon and retinoic acid both in a topical form so of course there's a study that is ongoing which will come out soon which will tell us the outcome of these cases the next case is a 24 year old girl who's noticed that there was always one eye was always darker and there is no variation noticed at all and this is static on clinical examination, it's unilateral, it's flat, and it's not pigmented in the sense brown pigmentation, but grayish blue. And it's under the conjunctiva. As you can see, if you take a Q-tip and move it, you will see that the conjunctiva over it moves. The pigmentation is episcleral. No cysts, and it is diffuse. And this is what is called nevus of Ota or oculocutaneous melanosis. This gentleman is Dr. Ota, who's not an ophthalmologist, but a pathologist who wrote about this. There is episcleral pigmentation in involving the lids and adnexan. And interestingly, there is no risk of trans of, 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 you know, uh, of progression to a conjunctival melanoma. But these patients have a higher risk of uveal melanoma. So an annual checkup is needed for fu dilated fundoscopy. And once in three years, an MRI of the orbit or brain may be recommended because meningeal melanomas have also been reported in these patients. And after attending our course last year, we had a patient who, a, a surgeon who also thought that maybe they diagnosed PAM and referred a case who was, whom he was all set to operate under the microscope and he thought this could be PAM and sent it to us saying, I think we have a case of PAM. Can you diagnose this and see what it is? The patient had actually not even noticed that his eyes were pigmented. What could it be? Now, unlike PAM, this is bilateral pigmentation. This is perilimbal. And it is flat and not involving any other part of the conjunctiva, including the fornices. So this is racial melanosis. The term racial melanosis is now replaced with complexion acquired melanosis. This is seen mostly in, in, in darker individuals. So we see a lot in India, especially in South India. It's bilateral, it's perilimbal, it's almost symmetrical. And in this case, you have to just observe them with a 0% risk of conversion into a melanoma or any tumor. You can safely send the patient back to your cataract surgeon or do the cataract yourself. This. Now, this is a sitter, but in any case, I'll, I'll, I'll talk about the talking points here. It's a 53-year-old male with a large uh, nodular elevated lesion. Noticed two months ago with a sudden increase. You can see it's unilateral, it's solid. It's got angry feeders over here, multiple of them. There is corneal encroachment. As you can see, if you take a line that goes across the two longest, two widest dimensions, the crisscrossing point is over the limbus, which tells you it has started at the limbus. This is a clear uh, pigmented ocular surface squamous neoplasia and OSSN. Uh, keratin, rose bengal are all. Uh, ancillary tests that can help you confirm the diagnosis. Uh, the, the first thing that we should do before we think of surgical or medical management is to get an HIV screening test. More than a third of patients who present with OSSN are HIV positive. Uh, pigmented OS OSSN, to aid in the diagnosis, the sensitivity of keratin specs having rose bengal positivity with the presence of feeders is almost 95%. A, a, a uh, uh, cursory glance and examination at the lymph nodes is important, preauricular, submandibular, submental, and anterior cervical. Uh, it is always elevated, nodular, and irregular compared to all the conjunctival lesions that we saw earlier. And this is the next case. This is this is a 63-year-old male. Initially, I had noticed a small black spot a few months ago, 
and underwent an excision and this was rapidly increasing. This picture is, is courtesy LVP as you can see there, yeah. Uh, and you can see from the different angles, these are not simple feeder vessels, these are angry red fe feeder vessels. Uh, there is variegated appearance, there is pigmentation, areas of deep pigmentation, areas of deep pigmentation, corneal encroachment with a flat area of over it. This is a conjunctival melanoma. And like we said, there are three ways that a melanoma can develop. It can be a de novo melanoma, which develops on its own with no preceding lesion. There can be a nevus, like we discussed, less than 2% of uh, melanomas are from nevus or nevi. And the third is PAM with atypia, because we know PAM with atypia as a very high chance of progression to melanoma. These are elevated, thickened, nodular lesions very vascular and they need to be aggressively treated because by the time they are diagnosed of all the patients who are diagnosed with conjunctival melanoma 35 percent develop metastasis within five years also ossn goes to the preauricular lymph nodes and into the orbit conjunctival melanomas go straight to the brain so brain metastases are more common the Preferred surgical uh, excision for this is the no-touch technique, which the shields have dis described. Regardless of that, what we see that the recurrence rate of patients with conjunctival melanoma is still very high. It means that the, the current treatment strategies that we have for conjunctival melanoma are suboptimal. So this is basically the uh, a ca a capsule of whatever we've seen, the nevus, the CAM, PAM, and uh, conjunctival melanomas in case you, know, you need to take a shot of it. This is uh, a good table that covers everything, including the primary management. Uh, before we wrap up, I'll just go through a few unusual cases to show that not every pigmented lesion falls into the nevus to melanoma spectrum. This was a case of a subconjunctival mass which was amelanotic, no dilated vessels, no feeders, no keratin, no pigmentation. And it was seen in a child and the child had barely noticed that there was this pea-sized swelling. It was excised and it was an epibulbar schwannoma. So sometimes there can be these unusual lesions that land up at unusual places. This was a 12-year-old girl with a 6-month-old history of pigmented lesions on the conjunctiva, bilateral, painless, gradually increasing. And it had an unusual color. There was a metallic sheen over it. And we wondered what it was. We put a drop of paracaine with a earbud, just scraped it, and all the color came off. What it was was bitot spots, vitamin A deficiency. And the child had been applying kajal every day, and the kajal debris kept going over the tear film and accumulating over the irregularity of the bitot spots. So it was bitot spots that with kajal debris over years that appeared like a pigmented conjunctival tumor. Uh, this is a lady with a conjunctival lesion which was looking like a, a you know a filigree pattern like a papillary pattern on micro on a uh, slit lamp you can see these small central vessels arterioles or uh, you know capillaries that have this filigree pattern this is a squamous papilloma and can be excised with cryotherapy at the base uh, this was another case, and of course, these are these are often seen in tropical regions. Even in Bombay, we've come across these patients who come up with you know pedunculated lesions over the conjunctiva. The most important feature here is these yellow specks here. The moment you see these yellow specks, uh, the diagnosis is fairly straightforward. It is rhinosporidiosis, and they always have a history of taking dips in swimming pools and uh, rivers in the you know outside, not a uh, a proper swimming pool but in rivers and canals and that's how they get this so to wrap up not every colored dot on the conjunctiva is a nevus or and similarly not every dark colored dot is a melanoma there is a lot of things that fall in between the spectrum and even out of the spectrum but the only thing that help us decide what it is is a detailed history and examination and documentation and when in doubt refer because refer is always better than recur uh, with that, I think I've just managed to finish in time. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Akshay. That was uh, really, really uh, well done with just the uh, important points and uh, the unusual cases also were excellent. Thank you so much. Dr. Akshay has a session somewhere else, so I will... Uh, let's take some questions if anyone has any right now for him because he may not... We may not catch him later. So does anyone have any questions? 
thank you okay and thanks akshay for for a change one of our courses is actually having a near full hall and i think a lot of credit goes to the chief instructor for planning the course this way thanks thank you akshay that's very sweet okay we will have a next speaker dr anasuya ganguli kapoor so i'd like to introduce her <coughs> while she's setting up thank you so anasuya currently heads the oculoplasty and ocular oncology division at lv prasada institute at vijayawada uh, she has completed her basic education from west bengal and done her a uh, fellowship at lv prasad i institute uh, prior to that she did a post graduation at aims um she basically has literally uh, i would say grown the department and built it uh, you know sort of piece by piece and brick by brick at vijayawada and now is a force to reckon with and uh, does a lot of uh, work at lv prasad which is uh, creating not just uh, just the patient but also creating awareness for ocular oncology especially retinoblastoma and uh, besides this she loves teaching and is actively part of a lot of research and uh, also has a great passion for indian classical dancing uh, her talk will be the baby's eyes bulging the hits and misses in pediatric tumors thank you thank you savati for that kind introduction so um, and also for the opportunity to present here today so the topic given to me by savari is uh, the baby's eyes bulging the hits and misses in pediatric tumor it is uh, there some problem can someone help it is blanked out here it is chalo और टाइमर को टेन मिनट्स करो नाइन नहीं इट विल कम बी आई ट्राइड इट ना अभी ट्राई किया था ना उनका हो जाएगा टाइमर को टेन मिनट्स कीजिए प्लीज थैंक यू सो इन आर एवरीडे जर्नी इन द क्लिनिक्स वेदर इट्स अ हिट और वी मिस द टारगेट वाइल ट्रीटिंग अ पेशेंट वी डेफिनेटली लर्न so today in the next uh, 10 minutes i will be sharing with you my experience my learning experience in treating these 10 cases so the first patient is the 16 year old uh, girl who was brought to our clinic with uh, by her mother with the complaint of both eye prominence since one year this was a plain and simple case of a pseudo proptosis secondary to high myopia so just a simple refraction and measurement of the axial length helps in all these cases so the first learning pearl is beware of uh, pseudo proptosis a uh, ipsilateral eyelid retraction or a small eye or a contralateral ptosis or a big eye may mimic pseudo proptosis so before we start with the etiological uh, diagnosis of proptosis rule out pseudo proptosis in non cases so this 12 year old uh, girl came to us with sudden uh, popping out of the left eye uh, and this was coinciding with a attack of upper respiratory tract infection so this was a the uh, ct scan showed the, these ill defined multiple cystic masses um, uh, microcyst macrocyst and which was trans compartmental that is involving both the intraconal and extraconal space with air fluid levels which was typical of a venal lymphatic malformation with bleed so she did well with bleomycin aspiration of the blood and bleomycin sclerotherapy so whenever there is a sudden intraorbital hemorrhage in a child think of venal lymphatic malformation this 3 year old uh, boy was brought to us with the complaint of left eye vision drop since 12 days he was treated somewhere else with iv methyl prednisolone with a diagnosis of atypical um optic neuritis of the left eye but what do we see here we see that the child has periocular um, puffiness there is subconjunctival hemorrhage both eyes left eye had optic disc edema and this is the ct scan picture where you see both eye has homogeneous soft tissue density extending uh, which is uh, molding around the globe in the anterior cuts and posteriorly extending uh, up till the apex and the left eye it is compressing on the optic nerve causing the disc edema so this uh, we ordered for a peripheral blood smear 
which uh, had a clear picture of uh, acute myeloid leukemia. So whenever you see rapid onset proptosis with bilateral soft tissue homogeneous lesion, rule out myeloid sarcoma, just ask for a peripheral blood smear. But the case is not always so simple. Like this particular child, six year old male, you can see there's a supranasal mass and a very rapid onset since the past 10 days. There is a homogeneous mass in the supranasal quadrant. We again ordered for a peripheral blood smear, but this time it was normal. We went ahead and did an orbitotomy with mass excision. And uh, you can see there are uh, round blood cells with uh, loosely arranged and which was myeloperoxidus positive again suggesting that this was a case of acute myeloid leukemia. CD68 and 34 positivity indicating that these were the M4, M5 types of AML. So negative peripheral blood smear does not rule out myeloid sarcoma always. The child can have alleukemic leukemia. Again, this five-year-old male was diagnosed elsewhere as orbital cellulitis and started on uh, IV antibiotics. So what we see here is the right eye has a orbital cellulitis like picture. The globe behind is not visible. But what is very apparent and shouldn't have been missed is the left eye uh, leukocoria, which is there. So the referring ophthalmologist had done a uh, CT scan orbit where you see both eye has intraocular tumor with calcification. but uh, this is um, a red alert there that these patients with bilateral retinoblastoma are at very high risk of de developing secondary tumors. So CT scan orbit is not the ideal investigation for them. A MRI orbit would have been better in this case. So this was a both eye retinoblastoma. The pseudo orbital cellulitis like picture in the right eye was because of tumor necrosis. So we treated only IV antibiotics have no role. We treated with IV steroids, the swelling came down and the, then the child was treated in as per the protocol of retinoblastoma. So orbital or ocular imaging is a mandate whenever the fundus is not visible. Uh, just a B scan helps in these cases. So this is a very interesting case. A two-year-old girl came to us with the left eye prominence since three weeks. So what do we see here? We see that the left eye has proptosis. There is periocular swelling, which is uh, extending towards the temporal fossa. There is exposure keratopathy and severe chemosis. In the right eye, there is periocular ecchymosis, the typical raccoon eye appearance. So CT scan orbit showed a triradiate mass, a heterogeneous mass you can see here um, uh, with an intraorbital component, a temporal fossa component, and also an intracranial extension. There were lytic lesion on the bone, uh, in the frontal bone, maxillary bone here. So on systemic examination, you can see that the, there's a distended abdomen, bilateral pedal edema. We went ahead and did a USG abdomen, and there was a mass in the adrenal gland. So this was a case of metastatic adrenal neuroblastoma, so the Hutchinson syndrome, where there is skull bone metastasis from adrenal neuroblastoma. So the learning lesson here, periocular ecchymosis, proptosis, and bony facial swelling in a child, please rule out metastatic neuroblastoma. This eight-year-old uh, boy came to us with prominence with vision loss since one week in the right eye. You can see a homogeneous mass there causing indentation of the globe. There was a right eye cherry red spot or CRO causing the decreased vision. So peripheral blood smear was again normal. We went ahead and excised the mass and this is what we found. So you can see a mixed uh, population of inflammatory cells along with copious eosinophils and uh, lymphocytes, CD31 positive, a typical finding in angiolymphoid hyperplasia of orbit. So. Uh, the child responded well to oral steroids. So ALA before this, I have never uh, before this seeing this ca uh, case, I have never read about this um, condition also. So ALA is a rare benign idiopathic vasoproliferative disorder. They respond very well to steroids. So this three-year-old child was diagnosed at optic nerve glioma, given chemotherapy six cycles with EBRT, and then the child was referred to us as a non-responder. So what do we see here? There are these brownish ma macules on the trunk, typical cafe outlet spot, and a fusiform swelling of the optic nerve, involving the optic nerve and extending to the chiasma. So this is a typical case of optic pathway glioma in a case of neurofibromatosis type 1. 
so what we need to understand here is the uh, post ebrt and post chemo so ex this is extensive extensive um, optic pathway glioma so the treatment done was correct but the expectation that the tumor will shrink with ebrt and chemotherapy is incorrect majority of the patients what we see is that the tumor is stabilized post ebrt and um, chemotherapy so we need to look for progression progression is what guides us in treating these patients and by progression i mean clinical deterioration vision and visual fields and radiological progression so that is what we need to see and um, accordingly treat these patients so a 5 year old with rapidly progressive left eye pro uh, proptosis you see a supero nasal mass Uh, homogeneous well circumscribed so this was a case of orbital rhabdomyosarcoma so these cases we need to avoid incision biopsy and perform a complete as much as possible debulking and uh, uh, followed by uh, chemotherapy and radiation plus minus radiation based on the histopathology report so um, excision biopsy is what should be done in these cases moving on to my last case a 3 year old with uh, right eye prominence since 1 month uh what do we see here so a superior orbital mass causing bone erosion so a typical finding seen in langerhan cell histiocytosis so whenever you come across such a patient a child uh you can do a frozen section and inject intralesional steroids so it was cd1 a positive confirmatory for langerhan cell histiocytosis so superior orbital mass with bone destruction in a child think of lch confirm with frozen section and inject intralesional steroids systemic workup is a mandate to rule out multifocal involvement in all these cases so in our journey in this hits and misses to summarize what we learned beware of pseudoproptosis sudden intraorbital hemorrhage in a child think of venolymphatic malformation and consider bleomycin sclerotherapy rapid onset proptosis with bilateral soft tissue homogeneous lesion always rule out myeloid sarcoma by doing a simple peripheral blood smear negative peripheral blood smear does not always rule out myeloid sarcoma orbital imaging is a mandate whenever you can't see the fundus in your clinic periocular ecchymosis proptosis bony facial swelling in a child suspect neuroblastoma strongly ALH is a rare benign idiopathic vasoproliferative disorder the diagnosis is clenched by histopathology they respond well to steroids combination of clinical deterioration with radiological progression guides treatment in optic nerve glioma avoid incision biopsy and perform complete excision in cases of orbital rhabdomyosarcoma superior orbital mass with bone destruction in a child think of LCH and consider injecting intralesional steroids Thank you, everyone, for a patient listening. Uh, Anastasia, thanks. That was really, really good. And uh, uh, progressively, how a patient would come into the OPD and how we can break it down, and especially the last two slides actually summarize the whole thing. And you can sit here now. So, to me, Anna. Uh, thank you that was excellent and uh, i hope it helps uh, even people in the audience uh, at least you know go in the right direction so our next speaker is dr shruti tara uh, shruti is uh, a consultant at sankarai hospital and uh, it heads the orbit and oculoplasty services she basically uh, uh, is trained from uh, the uh, at uh, singapore at um, singapore national <laughs> hospital with dr gangadhar sundar and uh, uh, she's been a dear friend so we've been actually doing ics for quite some time and we were just talking about the fact that uh, uh, this variation of ic has been quite popular and we are in a fourth year of uh, fourth year of this ic and uh, she's uh, always uh, come up and been uh, you know shown her misses and how she can improvise them and i think uh, that's a key of a very good surgeon uh, thank you and she will be speaking about a sticky uh, watery eye hits and misses thank you dr savri and thank you for including me every single time in your ic i hope i'll be able to do some justice so in the next couple of uh, uh, minutes we'll just go through hits and misses in the lacrimal cases so this patient Yeah. 
So this was a patient who had had uh, uh, an endonasal DCR done elsewhere twice. And when I went in, I did an external DCR here. Uh, it was like, just like any other routine DCR. It, was, it looked like as if nothing had been done. So I just went ahead and did a routine. Why am I not able to uh, control my video here? Sorry, sorry. Yeah, that's no problem. Yeah, I know you want to pause it, right? Yeah, I want yeah. to pause and not just that, I want to sometimes. Um, fast forward some videos, otherwise it would take long time. What is? No, that thing is not coming. Would you want somebody, uh, next person to take over? Because uh, maybe I'll just go through the, yeah, because this is not coming in here. Otherwise, I'll not be able to finish in 10 minutes. I'm not able to have the control here. I need help, Okay, uh, you give me that. No, you give me the uh, other one. Okay, I'll just see what was in that. No, it's not uh, happening here, Savri. Yeah, you can do that. Or if it's in this, I can just go through. Um, We see a lot of uh, plastic crowd, but I think sorry, there's some who um, also might be yeah, uh, doing plastic that. in their practice. Shall we? Yes. Uh, sorry, One sorry. sec, let it just come. It'll come. Huh. Okay, so this patient presented, um, you know, he had had his external DCR as I told you, I mean, endonasal DCR as I told you done earlier. And Oh, it's not playing. No. no. There's no, it's not playing. Maybe you can go ahead and present, we'll see. Uh, we had uh, a couple of issues in this hall yesterday which got rectified. So I guess we're still struggling with some of them and uh, hopefully we'll... Uh, maybe uh, the next speaker can go ahead and while I see if I can fix that. Sure. So we'll just uh, just skip and come back. So our next speaker is uh, Dr. Rishikesh Tadwalkar, who will be talking about a sudden drooping eyelid, the hits and misses. Um, so Rishi is a, a one of the, I think, few people in Bombay who really started doing oculoplasty and orbit. And he's trained at Arvindai Hospital. And uh, he doesn't like me saying he's very senior, but he is. and. Uh, He's an excellent surgeon and teacher. And uh, I think uh, all of us, including me, yeah. uh, it's very rare to find a colleague who will encourage you and help you out in your early days of your practice. And so besides being an excellent uh, oculoplastic surgeon, he's uh, also you know, been uh, uh, hel sort of instrumental in a lot of us you know, sort of settling down in Mumbai into our private practice. And we've had the pleasure of doing two major meetings in uh, Mumbai, uh, our oculoplasty meetings, and we had a lot of fun doing it. So thank you, Arishi. Thank you. Uh, Sauri, I know that uh, 
when when somebody doesn't have many academic uh, achievements you have to focus on other aspects and uh, so sorry i'll just move on since we don't have to ask anyone whether they can hear or see the presentation let's go directly to the presentation now so uh, many times uh, when a child uh, comes to you like this 6 uh, to 8 year old child he came and uh, he was referred and as might be a practice with many uh, oculoplasty surgeons referred for ptosis surgery in a congenital ptosis but uh, as you can see something is not right because especially when the parents say that the ptosis is only since 2 months you have to listen to parents very carefully and when you ask them to give a recent photograph from past they gave this photograph now you are really uh, alert as to what you are dealing with even the lid doesn't look right you know the lid looks smooth and uh, swollen and in such cases now we are looking at some other etiology than congenital <coughs> sorry and what could it be infective inflammatory vascular infiltrative and when we think about this what would be our investigation there is no diurnal variation and uh, so we are not looking at say childhood myasthenia or something like this so when we are going for neuroimaging what we find is a typical cysticercus cyst in the superior rectus and lps complex and uh, with just conventional medical treatment the child recovers completely so this is one of the <coughs> cases where you have to remember that in childhood also ptosis can be acquired and when we pay close attention to history taking an examination you would not be missing this and avoiding uh, something like we are taking patient on the table and discovering that you are dealing with something else other than the congenital ptosis so the uh, type of acquired ptosis that we gen generally see are these involutional traumatic uh, neurogenic with third nerve palsy or myasthenic other myogenic ptosis uh, and of course mechanical another case i would like to say is this 32 year old male who complained that ptosis was gradually improving uh, in increasing for 2 to 3 years no history of trauma or diurnal variation he had recurrent redness off and on and pain so in such cases when you look closely the lid is uh, it's like moderate to severe ptosis and uh, uh, there is no swelling what type of ptosis does this look like so we are thinking of going through the whole list and then what additional evaluation that you are going to do including clinically so when we in such cases a comprehensive clinical evaluation itself will sometimes reveal something very simple like in this case when you just lift up the eyelid you look at there is a big staphyloma which was missed because the patient was directly referred as ptosis and the treatment totally changes uh, in such scenario so therefore a comprehensive clinical examination is important and that is just out you know underlined by this importance of by this case another patient 27 year old female whose right eye appears smaller only since 2 months again no diurnal variation very mild ptosis good light eyelid excursion now again what else are we looking for in mild ptosis with a short duration ocular movements uh, as we say no diurnal variation full range of movements pupils and why would we look at pupils is because sometimes you are having a case where there is difference in size of the pupil which points towards horner syndrome and these are the cases which generally would present with uh, uh, mild ptosis and therefore and then the what would be the preferred treatment of choice most of the times these cases they would get better with something like a facinella servat procedure so therefore again clinical examination is important this patient is clear cut 65 year old male with drooping since 6 months he had history of diurnal variation and in on examination variable ptosis again a very common acquired ptosis that we see in clinical practice he had full ocular movements and pupils were normal now normally we have many tests like fatigability eyes test rest test in which we can do right in our clinical setting in our office 
and what has been seen is that ice test shows a lot of uh, high degree of specificity like to diagnose myasthenia which of course can be corroborated with other tests like EMG or doing hydrophonium or ne neostigmine test and other uh, lab work. So in this patient, this is the pre and the post uh, neostigmine uh, which clearly shows a significant amount of recovery of ptosis and so that the patient can be treated with conservatively with pyridostigmine. Now, uh, coming to the next patient, 33-year-old male, he has drooping in the right eye since two months. Again, he is not very sure about, about the variability, severe ptosis with diplopia. If we look at the movements, so the patient has ptosis in the right eye and he has adduction deficit, adduction deficit, then he, his elevation is again but, and he also has some amount of deficit in depression. So now when we look at this picture, severe ptosis with poor upper lid excursion, not much variability but diplopia, restricted elevation and depression and severely restricted adduction, no visual disturbance. So here we are like facing either a third nerve palsy or myasthenia or ocular myopathy Again, my, uh, you have to remember that myasthenia can present in, in very, very different scenarios and different ways and therefore it's like a masquerade and therefore we have to look at myasthenia before we look at anything else. Again, in this patient, uh, you can see that post neostigmine, there is complete recovery of both ocular movements as well as uh, uh, his lid level. You can see here complete eye movements are uh, recovered and again this was which looked like a third nerve palsy this patient had myasthenia and this is a uh, isolated pupil sparing third nerve palsy where there is ptosis and restriction of uh, adduction and elevation again another patient with uh, who has a recovering third nerve palsy where you can see that there is mild ptosis in primary gaze but a vertical gaze limitation and eyelid gets retracted when the or you can say hang up with depression and adduction and this is misdirected re re regeneration in a third nerve palsy so again a patient who presents with ptosis but actually uh, he has a neurological basis to the uh, etiology lastly the 59 uh, year old female with uh, gradually drooping upper left upper eyelid no diurnal variation or diplopia recessed upper lid and this is uh, uh, basically the classical picture of an upper neurotic ptosis that we see and uh, there are various approaches that have been described of course the surgeon uh, preference as well as ease with dealing with these scenarios they can uh, deal with either an anterior or a posterior approach so these generally the cases where there is quite a high level of predictability in uh, results because you see that either levator is disinserted or there are there is dehiscence and then uh, a simple procedure can rectify that 23 year old male again ptosis following injury with fish hook and there is no external injury mark severe ptosis poor lid excursion and restricted elevation now in this patient uh, there is always the uh, you know con uh, conundrum you can say that because with no levator function what are you going to do either a frontalis sling or a levator exploration with reattachment some authors have also uh, described vitnal sling which is a modification of a frontalis sling only that uh, the levator uh, the eyelid is attached to the vitnal sling amend now here liv levator exploration and sometimes reattachment especially if the patient presents early can give you good results. So in summary, it is particularly important that pseudotosis is clearly recognized and that a neurological or a myogenic cause of ptosis which requires further evaluation is excluded. It is important to palpate around the eyelid, evert the eyelid, look at the phonesis. You have to differentiate between a preganglionic to from a postganglionic Horner syndrome. 
myasthenia as we have seen in couple of cases is is can mimic any kind of any kind of physical presentation so therefore a high index of suspicion is required and we have to exclude the possibility of aberrant regeneration in cases with history of facial palsy we have to take particular care making whenever you're making a skin crease incision in aponeurotic process because the lid is uh, very thinned out and a lid guard is used thank you for your attention Uh, thank you, Rishi. Uh, that covered the entire gamut of all the acquired tosis and it was bang on time. And hopefully we'll be able to uh, continue with Shruti. It's working there, but it doesn't seem to be working here. I have no clue why. No worries, we'll try. We have time not to worry. Now that you gave us a teaser of that lacrimal case, I want to know what happened. <laughs> <laughs> what happened after? Okay. <laughs> Let's see. Hopefully it works this uh, time. Yeah, picture abhi baki hai, so we're waiting now. No, picture abhi bhi baki hai. It doesn't seem to happen. Why? Do you want to shift it to my laptop? I think so. Yes. Let Roshmi present. I'll give you my laptop. <laughs> No, I think it's the... Or if I, if I play like this, is it okay? Huh, huh? Yes, it's yes. It's fine? Okay. So this was um, a patient who had had an ex uh, endonasal DCR done twice. Once for uh, um, draining the pus and second time the routine DCR was done as per the patient. One so second, when I opened just up... Just close the small window so you'll get a bigger window. Those small no, ones. No, this is not running in... Uh, oh, okay, okay. Fine, as, yeah. sorry, sorry. Go ahead. So uh, when I did a DCR, it was like a, as if I was doing a routine case, you know, it was like very virgin. So that was it. So it was like, you know, it was as good as nothing being done. And when I, the sac was completely, you know, um, inflamed and sent for biopsy and that is what it came as. Now the next slide. So what we do, what we learned from this is get yourself trained if you want to do an endonasal DCR well. If not, do a very good external DCR. Now, good external DCR here, what I mean to say is at least five millimeters from the common canalicular area should be free of any obstruction. So this was at another patient who had had, as per the, uh, um, the uh, discharge summary, had a DCT done. Now what happened? Same thing. I could see the entire sac there. The sac was still intact and I could do a perfect external DCR in this patient. Now this was another patient who presented with, you can see that there is a fistula kind of a thing here. There was, it was an opening and through this I could see the sac and it was filled with ointment. And when I went ahead, what I did was I just saw it was a, I did a complete uh, DCT here. So what probably would have happened is they have removed one wall of the sac and the other wall was still intact. So an extern, um, um, complete DCT was done. The fistulectomy also, I did the, uh, removed the fistula. And the common canaliculus area was cauterized. And here I'm just removing and refreshing the edges of the fistula and sutured. So doing a good complete DCT when indicated is important. So this patient had had his DCT done, complaint of tearing, and he wanted, his, um, wanted the tearing to be um, reduced. Sorry, a lady patient. And um, so what I did was removed all the tissues around the common canalicular area. This was not the sac, but it was just a fibrotic tissue around that. A complete removal of the fibrotic tissue is done. And the common canalicular area was, a sharp dissection was done around the common canaliculus and the obstruction removed. A mitomycin C was applied and a very large ostium and a large sac flap is created here. A large nasal mucosal flap, I mean. A large flap here is important because you are bringing the nasal mucosa all the way up to the common canaliculus. You need to do that. 
and a routine intubation is done and here when you are anchoring the nasal mucosal flap this has to be anchored to the tissue above the common canalicular area and three such broad bites are taken so uh, this was one um, study we Uh, we did 15 such cases with a follow-up period of one year and anatomical and physiological success was seen in 14 patients with one patient had a partial regurgitation with a small ostium. This was probably because he had had a repeat procedures done before um, and this is due for publication in the Korean Journal. Now this patient had had her DCR done and if you can see here the ostium is way higher up supposed to be somewhere here it's higher up and it is occluded so what is different in this DCR is an incision is made along the same um, scar area and there could be a lot of could be a lot of bleeding and you can encounter a lot of fibrosis and this is one place where probably I would use a lot of cautery, adequate cautery I mean. And you have to go in anterior to the already made ostium, uh, the old ostium which is there and extend the ostium along. So it's not actually not, uh, it's not po impossible to make a good DCR in these, uh, in such scenarios and I will show you something here. This is the kind of movement which probably should not be done. Okay, I have to skip that. Okay. And inflate the residual sac. Sometimes residual sac you can actually inflate and make a sac flap as well. A nas uh, sac flap is made and similarly a nasal mucosal flap is also made. So what probably happened here was you can see this agar nasi air cells are there. These are much more anteriorly placed. Sometimes they get confused that the agar nasi air cells and when you go into the ethmoid sinus they probably sometimes would think that that is a nasal mucosa. Actually nasal mucosa will not be so thin. And a large, uh, so you can see that those are the agar nasi air cell bones that I am taking out which are thin and anteriorly placed and a sac flap and similar routine DCR is uh, af after that is performed like you know and what I wanted to show here was it is patent and when you are anchoring this is the technique that I follow is doing a single square knot. Now why single square knot is because it is easy to remove in the OPD. So you can actually just rotate it the knot is rotated from the uh, one of the punctum and removed. Now what about a patient like this who comes with a, a traumatic um, lid laceration repair done. So when you see a, a laceration of this kind and you see the canaliculus is torn, feel free to redo the uh, procedure. A mini monocus stent is passed and you can see this, uh, um, it's not very clear maybe, a pink, a pale uh, cuff is there uh, um, in the pink background. So that would be the other cut end of the canaliculus. So a mini monocus stent is placed and a pericanaliculus stitch is taken and closed. Now what about a traumatic DCR? This patient had had repeated um, pain and um, swelling. So this was the patient uh, who had had his uh, open reduction and internal fixation done for his fracture elsewhere with a secondary nasolacrimal duct obstruction. So even here the um, it can be slightly bloody with fibrotic tissues. The only difference that I find here in when I'm doing a DCR in these patients are the bone can be relatively thicker 
is because of um, you know the uh, trauma that they've had the fracture that they've had there and the remodeling of the bone that has happened so otherwise it is um, it is not a it's relatively straightforward so you can make a nice big large flap i mean the uh, sac flap and the nasal mucosal flap is done by canalicular intubation placed and the wound closed so what we learned in this is when you are imaging a patient after the trauma and if there is a bono, bony nasolacrimal duct fracture it would probably be a good idea to do a primary intubation itself so this probably in the interest of time i would skip savri uh, go ahead go ahead um this is a conjunctival chalasis patient now what i was doing in the earlier stage they usually come with uh, uh, surface irregularities and tearing sometimes so this was in my earlier stage wherein i would block with giving a uh, subconjunctival block and then uh, so what happens that chalasis is completely lost you don't know where it is and you can see that i'm lifting up the conjunctiva and then cauterizing i'm using the fulguration here but what happens here is when you're lifting the conjunctiva the basic pathology in conjunctival chalasis is not just the conjunctiva but it is also the uh, the anterior teen and the tenons underneath so when i did that you could see you can see that there is all there is some residual chalasis here so this was the pre op and this is the post op you can see a small tear film is made but it isn't sufficient so then later what we started doing was under topical so when you're doing it under topical you can actually see that the conjunctiva is shrinking and uh, one or two rounds of uh, rows of such is given and you can see that there is a complete resolution of the chalasis uh, so this was something uh, and any pouting punctum is not is not a uh, pouting punctum or if there is a swelling medial to the uh, punctum is not a chalasian it can be a canaliculitis now this was something that i saw recently in my just last uh, uh, ot a routine dcr and i saw this mass between the nasal mucosa and the bone i really don't know what it is i've sent for pathology let's let's wait and see what i just uh, used the crescent and shaved it and i've sent it for uh, biopsy waiting for the report thank you uh so thanks shruti now that was a real video course i think we it's very hard to uh, suddenly video especially these kind of variations uh, when you're doing intro op uh so in whatever way you can capture it i think that's amazing and that was really a wide range of small small little little points which you do come up when you're doing and dcr is so common that these are really good tips and uh, to know when you're encountering thanks so much and all ended well with the videos yeah i'll just set roshmi up then we can take a question so our next speaker is uh, dr roshmi gupta roshmi will be speaking on inflammation infections or in the orbit hits and misses so roshmi has uh, trained at calcutta medical college and went on to obviously do a fellowship at lv prasada institute and john moran i center at utah and uh, she set up the first and sort of the largest oculoplasty services in karnataka and heads uh the oculoplasty and oncology services at narayan netralay she has received the best video and best orbit paper and the raman mittal paper and uh, she is uh, uh, also published a lot but more than that uh, she is a dear friend and excellent presenter and her ability to algorithmically think through any difficult uh, sort of uh, uh, orbital or any situation is i think something that's just her forte and she can break it down and really simplify it and come down to a diagnosis so thanks so much me pal we will just take your question we we have time for questions so thanks avri that's a very uh, generous introduction okay we are going to be talking about uh, hits and misses in the orbit tumor inflammation infection So it's a pleasure to be part of this instruction course. And we will directly go into the cases. The 
First thing I saw about this patient was this. This is uh, last year, May. The radiological report, which says suspicious for fungal infection. And then this is the photo that came my way from another practitioner in the same city. Yes, that is a little scary, definitely. It's been there for about three or four days. The patient is a diabetic. However, if you start looking at these images, the orbit looks inflamed. The nasal mucosa is thickened. But look at the sinuses. They're absolutely clear. All sinuses, I haven't put all the cuts, and so initially it was seen by one of the, my ENT colleagues who took two biopsies from nasal turbinate, which were negative for tumor, uh, for mucor. Once again, if you look at this, you'll see the recti are thickened. Okay, and they're taking up contrast. And you'll look at the shape of the recti. What does it remind us of? Now, retrospectively, if you go back to this picture, take a look at this part of the lid. There's a clear-cut lateral flare. So in that situation, it was a little difficult to persuade people to put the patient on steroids. But that's what we did. And this is after the first cycle of IVMP resolved. He was also diabetic, so ultimately we had to go into periocular steroids and we had to get another nasal biopsy before the rheumatologist would agree to put him on immunosuppressants. But yes, it's a year down and he's fine. So keep at it. We need to correlate clinical and radiological findings. Case two, this is referred to me as an orbital cellulitis, duration of less than a week. It's red, it's swollen, but the patient is not in any pain. Hmm? And orbital cellulitis, one of the first things I do, a suspected one, is to do a blood count. WBC is 1900. That should raise 1900, not 19,000. So that should raise all kinds of red flags. The imaging that he went out and got was not great, but you can make out that there's something in the preceptal area, a soft tissue mass. And when we did the biopsy, you can see a mass, which is, this is the orbicularis, a mass suborbicular, which is a kind of a layer. So we took that out and it turned out to be atypical lymphoid cells with CD3 positive, high-grade T-cell lymphoma. So we need to correlate ocular and systemic findings. Case three. Okay, this is, uh, you realize that I'm very old. I started practicing before bleomycin was on the scene. So this is one of the patients when bleomycin came on the scene, I was very excited. Uh, you see the fluid, fluid level? Oh yes, these are macrocystic lesions. We can aspirate, we can put a sclerosant. Oh yay. And this is WhatsApp follow-up. Our patients are like that nowadays. So the patient has recovered perfectly. But then what happens? This is not a hit, not a miss. This is you know just what it is. Then what happens? I see another child, similar onset. They could do only an MRI, uh, only a CT scan, not an MRI. But if you can make out in the MRI also, the internal density is low. And if you see that point, that's a phlebolith. That's a pretty clear indicator of a venolymphatic malformation. Because cavernous hemangioma doesn't develop phleboliths. It's the venous malformations that develop phleboliths. So here again, I went in all confident, okay, I'm just going to aspirate and put a sclerosant. What I missed out, what I forgot, was when the child presented, he was anemic. And so to correct the anemia, it took a month. So by the time I went in there, it's all solid. 
it's clotted and organized. So ultimately, I had to you know, go in through a lid crease incision and evacuate the lesion and then put sclerosant. So let's remember that a lot of our lesions show a temporal shift in the nature of the disease. If you've seen a patient once and you're seeing them again after a month, please reevaluate. This is a lady who came with a pretty typical dacryadenitis and she had the pigmentation on her feet, which she developed. We took a biopsy, which showed granulomatous inflammation, non-necrosing granulomatous, okay? So once again, this uh, pa particular patient is a medic. So a lot of people pitched in with their opinions that yes, it can be sarcoid, no, sarcoid is not so good. It's probably TB, we need to take care. We went through PCR, we went through quantiferon. Nothing is indicative. So ultimately the patient refused to have systemic steroids and we treated her with periocular steroids only. She, the lacrimal situation resolved. However, a little later, she developed hyalur lymphadenopathy and collapse and fibrosis of the inferior lobe. Okay. Second opinions are good. Maybe third opinions are good. Half a dozen opinions are not good. So probably what we could have done is probably started her on ATD and then given the steroids. That could have been a choice. And this lady has been suffering this kind of a thing from 2013 onwards. Initially, she was diagnosed as a sarcoidosis and responded to steroid. And every time the swelling comes up, she puts herself on a dose of steroids and maintains herself on five milligram of steroid. All right. But now even that's not enough. She's in pain. And if you look at it, the entire upper area is lumpy. And what's a problem is that it looks like that the rectus is swollen. Hmm? She has never been biopsied. She turned out to be IgG4 related disease. And this is with the steroid. And then the next step now in a particularly uh, you know, stubborn IgG4 related disease would be rituximab. Because rituximab deals with the B cell related uh, conditions and ultimately IgG4 related disease you look at the cells they're plasma cytoid cells so they're com coming from the same family of cells so that's how it works for this patient so I realized that in 2013 whoever seen that was not that aware of IgG4 disease because it so possibly we need to keep reevaluating old patients in the light of newer knowledge. Do we have time? Okay. Quickly. This again, this is long back, 2014. This patient definitely has a vascular lesion, and this is all diffuse all over the muscles, all over the optic nerve. Obviously, we can't take the whole thing out. So I injected some cyanacrylate glue and debulked part of it. In 2016, she comes back saying, look at this, it's coming back. And so that is when I started her on the bleomycin injections. 2020, it comes back for a recurrence and you can see it's mostly the anterior lesion, a little bit at the back. So bleomycin injection and this is how she's maintaining now. So you might need to treat a patient multiple times but we need to replan in view of newer advances. Thank you. Thank you, Roshmi. That was uh, excellent cases with a lot of uh, twists and some humor also, and how we have to keep uh, renovating. So I'll go set up.
So I'm going to be, uh, I'm Dr. Sabri Desai. I'm going to be talking about hits and misses in uh, decompression, thyroid eye disease decompression, which I understand that is a slightly more uh, advanced, uh, meaning it's more for plasty, but I think it's important to be aware also when you're referring patients because often people feel that, oh, it's not something that uh, you look okay, your vision is okay, fine, but there is always. Um, I practice in Mumbai at Hinduja Hospital uh, uh, and at Breach Candy Hospital in Mumbai and I only do oculoplasty, ocular oncology for the last 15, 16 years as do all of us on the panel. So let's... Uh, so orbital uh, decompression basically is about increasing the space in the orbit by removal of the walls, removal of fat, so as to reduce not just the proptosis but also give space for the optic nerve. Now timing is everything and we know that acute cases are commonly done, decompressions for dysthyroid optic neuropathy, very severe disfiguring proptosis or corneal exposure. The approaches are either transconjunctival, transnasal or endoscopic and eyelid crease approaches. But planned approaches are predominantly for severe inactive uh, proptosis, then also for asymmetrical disfiguring proptosis, for congestive uh, thyroid eye disease where we may not have optic neuropathy but have constant recurrences like this, and also just for basic inactive diseases for cosmesis. So what is the first thing that we don't want to miss in preoperative? So besides everything else that you do, we want to see that we do have a thyroid profile me, we've been working for so long with the endocrinology team now that we have developed certain protocols which we do four weeks before we get a report done before decompression and we see that the reports have to be normal. If they're skewed, then we re-look at posting the patient, especially if it's not an emergency. Encouraging stopping smoking is done right from day one. But TRAB is something definitely look at. So now if a TRAB or a thyrotropin receptor antibody comes something like this high, three to four weeks before surgery, I wouldn't touch the patient because there is a very pos high possibility that the patient, even after your surgery, will have a trigger and reactivation. But if it's low, like if it's just 1.522, then I'm okay with that. But the thing is that basically, TRAB takes a little time to come back to normal. So don't get alarmed if it's mildly raised, you can still go ahead with surgery. Now here's a patient with a unilateral inactive disease, has left eye lateral flare, proptosis, subtle, decided to do a fat decompression. I was very happy with my results, but the patient was absolutely unhappy. And he said that though I thought I did a good counseling and explained that the eyelid retraction would come down a bit, but we would need a second stage, he basically did not want the eyelid surgery and never came back because he felt that that should have been made clear. So counsel 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 and that is the biggest miss we cannot miss second is imaging when you're doing a decompression ct scan remains the choice so now there are a couple of types of disease which you need to look at especially you know if you're going to be operating so this is a fat disease as you can see the optic nerves are stretched uh, there is not much enlargement of the muscles this is a muscle disease not much fat it's only on one side but the muscles are enlarged and this is mixed, as you can see. There's some amount of enlargement of muscles. So it's kind of. So this is very important to make a note of so that you know when you're going and what you want to plan for the decompression. Then we start looking at the walls that you want. So of course, if the wall or the sinuses are very narrow, as is seen in this, then you know a medial wall decompression may not just be enough. But something roomy like this, the muscles are going to prolapse and give us a lot of space, not just for a... Uh, optic nerve, de I meaning for a, this dawn, but also for a cosmetic decompression. And you could use this medial wall decompression as one of the uh, sort of markers. Then in floor, what do you look for? You actually look for thickness. There are multiple papers which talk about attenuation of the walls due to the you know intraorbital pressure increased in thyroid eye disease, including uh, fractures which have occurred just because of the sheer orbital pressure. So in this, you can see that a thin wall like this will be easy to fracture. So you can, this is a good thing to start off to do a floor. And floor is very easy because we're used to fracture and repair. But a thicker wall like this, you'll have to be a little careful because you may not be able to really fracture it and you know do it. You can, of course, use drills and stuff. But this is something to make a note of. Then from the position of the cribriform plate is very important because a low set cribriform plate has to be kept, make a mental note so that you don't go very high. 
otherwise it's going to be a cribby plate for you and it's going to start leaking csf regarding lateral wall i would say the only real thing that you need to look out is the trigone area if it is not if it's small like this you may not get much lateral wall and you're going to be drilling drilling so just look at the trigone now let's take the first hit or miss so this was a patient with an acute thyroid eye disease with this thyroid optic neuropathy are not responding to intravenous methylprednisolone now i would have liked to really go and do her decompression but i knew i'm going to burn my fingers because there's such large muscles there's no space for me to go in even if i do a transcaruncular i really had a tough time to go in and uh, i would not really have much space yes i could have done a floor but i really didn't need to do that because only thing that was required was as you can see a proptosis is not so severe it's the dawn that's worse so we decided to do an endoscopic it's okay to know when to back off and let the uh, if you're comfortable with endoscopic surgery that's fine usually i'm there because uh, with the ent surgeons we work together so if they feel that they've not been able to get it or they're afraid of you know injuring the uh, medial rectus then we do it as a combined surgery but endoscopic works and you get a good uh, result and recovery second is this gentleman ag again uh, after three cycles was not responding his right eye was actually worse than the left eye though the left eye looks worse now in this case though he had enlarged muscles his lateral rectus is not enlarged is bulky and i knew that if you look at his bony windows it's very thinned out floor and medial wall i knew that i could easily go in but i decided to do a transcaruncular with an extension to the fornix and do a two walled approach for optic nerve and it worked very well because i knew that though there was muscles enlarged i had enough space and the bones were so thin that it was very easy to fracture and that's how he looked so the sequence of surgery must be maintained now just coming to some there are lots of groups who have their own theories of how much to decompress one is the kikawa group and one is the goldberg group and when you're doing it you will know what works in your hands but really the po uh, home uh, point when i want to drive home or the thing that we don't want to miss is something called a balanced decompression which is doing a lateral with a medial or maybe doing a medial with a fl uh, floor and how and when do you decide that uh, and along with fat so if we just take this lady inactive disease looks great she didn't like the her proptosis but what she really didn't like was the inferior scleral show which she didn't have before so if i had just done a lateral with a medial which is a good balance decompression with a lower lid retractor release i would have got the desired result but she was very clear that she did not want that so instead it combined it with a medial and a floor decompression with fat so that she didn't have any of a little bit she had a little bit here which resolved so along with the lower lid retractor so that's what a balanced decompression entails now coming to medial wall so basically you have to know where to enter which is the posterior lacrimal crest and that's where you're going to be punching and to not uh, cause a csf leak or go very high up your anterior and posterior ethmoidal vessels are a uh, sort of a horizontal mental marker and the approach is transcaruncular for floor of course it's inferior for nicheal but what we need to do know is that basically there is this imaginary inferomedial strut which is this which we'd like to retain there is not a specific anatomical structure it's imaginary and basically you want to punch around it you can leave a little more but it allows the inwards and downward movements of the eyeball especially when you're doing floor with medial so this is a short video of a medial wall decompression so it's a transcaruncular approach So the thing with this is when you have a very congested eye sometimes it's hard to go because you don't have much space. So if I'm doing a lateral or a floor I do lateral and then combine it with the floor uh, and then sometimes do medial. So a subconjunctival dissection is done then you feel for the posterior lacrimal crest then using a blunt tipped scissors again feeling for the posterior lacrimal crest and one bold move you open it up and then as is described you do a hand over hand technique. and you keep dissecting till you see the periosteum of the medial wall which you can incise reflect and then start punching and you get a very clear opening so once you can hang off it the thing with medial wall decompression is that mainly basically you want to be able to go really posteriorly and not leave out the posterior ethmoids 
floor is relatively easy because you're doing it in the similar approach as a fracture repair uh, and uh, I'm going to skip this because I'm running a little late and go to lateral wall and show you a short video of how lateral wall works. So the misses in lateral wall are that basically you need to uh, actually uh, decompress the, oh maybe mine is not, okay. So you have to decompress the trigone area, others you won't get the desired re uh, uh, reduction. Just doing the anterior part of the lateral wall really doesn't give you much of a reduction. So you do an eyelid crease just in the lateral one third. I'm taking one, I'm just going to take a minute more before we go to discussion. So that's a periosteal incision. So now I'm comfortable and uh, using the burrs that I have. So we use a flute burr. Uh, I use a five millimeter flute burr and you start drilling by making a lacrimal keyhole. So this little opening actually gives you so much view into the lateral and the posterior lateral part of the orbit. You will just see just by opening, it gives you so much uh, view. So this is actually what you've done. We first drilled this, this is what I, and now we'll be going downwards to the superior orbital fissure. So I'm using a five millimeter flute bow, which is now what I'm comfortable with. But initially I would use smaller ones to have more control. And then you go downwards and this is the entire basin that you want to drill out or the trigone area, which is what, what really gives you the decompression. So I'm going to end with this last one case is this lady who came with uh, in thyroid eye disease. She had a little bit of congestion, but we decided to do a routine decompression, medial and lateral wall. What I thought when went, and this was one of my first few cases I did way back in 2009 and 10, was very happy with the results. But post decompression, nine months later, she comes back with a significant process in the eye. So I said, okay, let's do a CT scan. So we did a CT scan and if you remember she had no enlargement of muscles and suddenly I see this really large lateral rectus and I also noticed something else that I never went back and did a CT scan and my medial wall decompression if you can see I'm so short I've not done it in the posterior half and gone above and the medial rectus is not even prolapsed. Fine that's okay I'd still got the desired result but what's going on here is this is the size of a lateral rectus and look at this bumpy lateral orbital rim. So basically what had happened is we had done a good, what I thought was a good decompression, but nine months later she had a reactivation. So I used, because this was one of my first few cases, I used a smaller burr and I did a much longer surgery, went very close to the muscle, stripped off the perimuscular sheath, removed a lot of the fat. So now I do leave a little bit of fat around the muscles and you need to keep putting a lot of saline, not raise too much heat because this as a long term can trigger inflammation which can cause this hyperosteosis and a sort of a rebound inflammation of the lateral rectus. This one case taught me so much that it really made me plan all cases and we went in and did a decompression again. So and she was better. But of course that case taught me a lot. And finally while there may be many hits, there are also lots of, uh, I mean, a lot of misses. There might be a lot of hits and thyroid decompression also can be, you know, really gratifying, not just to the patient, but also to the surgeon, especially because it's radically changing. Thank you. Sorry, I only took more time. So uh, just any questions? We have about four minutes. I actually had a few questions. Uh, Anasuya, I had a question that when you mentioned about doing peripheral blood smear, uh, CBC, so any child which comes with upper eyelid edema and where you suspect it, do you do like a CBC, uh, complete blood count, peripheral blood smear? Is that something that you advise as soon as a child comes? Especially with some of the cases you, how, like, how does one know that we should consider doing, uh, just for want of the audience? Yeah, so um, a child with unilateral or bilateral uh, periocular swelling and on CT scan, whenever we see that homogeneous soft tissue mass, is someone, even if it is unilateral, we will do a peripheral blood smear before moving on for surgery. Okay. And then I had, uh, is uh, Shruti, uh, Shruti had a question uh, I'd written down. Uh, when you were uh, talking about those DCT, your series, which was very nice. So, uh, 
what was the criteria for you to go in and operate like you said they had a lot of watering but not many people think of doing because dct is there are only two ways one is that you've uh, know that the patient has on record second is you've done a syringing with a quick regurg and then you do an imaging so what was the criteria that you based on on which to go back and actually give this patients a chance to do this approach so once that uh, the series that you are asking no in general in, in general, general. And you stent all of them? How long? Uh, six to ten to three months. Okay, longer than. Okay. Okay. Uh, if there are no questions, then we'll hand over the. There was oh, a sorry. question from there, no? Okay, sorry. There was a question between. Oh, sorry. Hi, Pallavi. Yes. How do you do the recording, Shruti? Sorry, Pallavi. How do you do the recording? How do you do the sudden recordings? So we'll add with that we'll conclude our session and hand it over to Dr. Kasturi, who everyone's waiting for. And I'm also going to invite on behalf of Dr. Shubha and the entire Aurangabad team for midterm oculoplasty. And it's going to be a super program because it's basically on eyelids, which everybody seems to love. And uh, besides that, you can also come to see Ajanta Alora, which is a great attraction. And we're all looking forward. And there is registration downstairs in the Allergan booth at a discounted rate. So please, please, all of you are most welcome.